Good morning. Welcome to week 35 of our systematic theology study, which we began a new topic last week. JD opened up with an introduction on angelology, which is the study of how humans interact with angels and how angels serve God's purposes. This morning, I'm going to ask the question, who is Satan? He's that fallen enemy, the enemy of God, the enemy of the church. What I hope that you will see is that we are in a very real spiritual battle with a very real enemy who is very evil. Now you might be wondering why would we even bother spending time from the pulpit on Satan? He certainly does not deserve our worship and that's true. I had those feelings going through my mind all week. Why give time to him? But consider this, when at war every good military leader studies the intelligence reports on the enemy before doing battle with them. And we have been given an extensive intelligence report on our enemy. It's called the Bible. So what we're going to do is what we always do on any particular topic is we study what it says about that topic. That's how we do systematic theology. But before we do this, we're going to need to go to the Lord in prayer. So join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, bless this lesson. Lord, thank you again for believers who come to learn what you have revealed through your word. It is my prayer, Lord, that you'll speak through this lesson, that we will understand who your adversary is, how powerful and active he is, and how much more powerful you are. May you be glorified through this lesson. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, let me begin by asking you a question. How do you know that Satan is real? How do you know Satan is real? Some of you could take a philosophical perspective and say, well, we know that evil exists, and there has to be a perpetrator of evil. And we know that Scripture says that God cannot and does not originate evil, he ordains it, but he's never the originator of evil. Therefore, since evil exists and there must be a perpetrator and it is not God, therefore Satan must exist. And I would agree with you. Philosophically, you're right. Or you could say, well, I know someone who had a satanic experience and many others have claimed belief in satanic experiences. And again, you might be true, but you still can't empirically, physically, laboratory confirmed scientifically prove that Satan exists. So how do we as believers know that Satan exists? Well, I think you all know the answer to that by now. There is a reliable historical account of human history with a very credible author. The author is the God of creation, the creator God, who also, by the way, happened to create Satan. It's a very important thing to keep in mind. The Bible is the Christian's only reliable witness to the actual existence of Satan. So this morning, like we always do, we're going to see what it says about him. My primary source for this lesson, as per usual, is MacArthur and Mayhew's Biblical Doctrine, gained insights through Wayne Gruden's Bible Doctrine, and also a book by Joel Beakey, Fighting Satan, Knowing His Weaknesses, Strategies, and Defeat. That's a major theme of our lesson today. Here is our outline. Satan's personhood, Satan's character, we're going to look at his past, present, and future schemes, we'll also look at his future judgments, and then we're going to end with a believer's defense against Satan. So let's start with number one, Satan's personhood. If you remember when we did our lesson on the Holy Spirit, um, we wanted to know, is the Holy Spirit? spirit, a real person, and we learned that a personhood, personhood itself, is not measured by physical characteristics like blood or bone or flesh. Instead, it's determined by the possession of three basic characteristics, cognition or intellect, having emotion, and having a will or a volition. So let's look and see if Satan has these things. Look at evidences that Satan is a real person. We see, indeed, that he does exhibit intellect. He is a smart, smart entity. You read Matthew chapter 4, Satan used his intellect 
and all of his schemes and intelligence to try to tempt Christ in the wilderness. And many other passages show that Satan is no dummy. He schemes, he uses his intellect to fool the believers. Secondly, he exhibits emotion. Throughout the scriptures, he exhibits anger, hatred. And in, for example, Ezekiel 28, he exhibited pride. That's why God cast him out of heaven down to the earth. Thirdly, he exercises his will volitionally. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.26, if you read that, Paul tells Timothy that the devil traps non-believers who have been held captive by him to do his will. So we see cognition, intellect, emotion, and volitional will. But there are some other evidences that give us a more complete picture of this person. For example, he is a created angel. Colossians 1.16 says that God created all things. Angels are things God created. Satan is a fallen angel, therefore he was created by God. Again, we look at Ezekiel 28, which was spoken by a prophet to a real man, the king of Tyre, but it was spoken to the evil power behind him. He says, you were an anointed guardian cherub, so he started as an angel in heaven. I placed you, you were on the holy mountain of God, but your heart was proud, so he was cast down. Satan was created by God like the rest of the angels. Additionally, he is a spirit being. We see this in 1 Kings 22. And 2 Chronicles 18, which both say the identical thing. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord saying, I will entice him. And then in Ephesians 2 verse 2, uh, he is called the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So he is a spirit being. And although you think about Matthew chapter 4, which we talked about where Satan tempted Christ in the wilderness. He appeared as a real human being, but indeed he is a spirit being who can manifest as a human. He also seems to have extraordinary mobility. If you consider the book of Job in uh, both chapter 1 and chapter 2, Satan tells God that he's been roaming around on the earth and walking around it. And then 1 Peter 5, 8 says, uh, be sober-minded, be watchful for your adversary the devil prowls around like a hungry lion looking for souls to devour. So he gets around and he can function on heaven as well as on earth. We see him again in 1 Kings 22, 2 Chronicles 18, which say that he's a spirit and he appears in heaven. But we also see him, we also see him operating on the earth like in Matthew 4 where he tempted Christ. And again, our passage in 1 Peter 5, 8, he prowls around looking for souls to devour. Finally, uh, we see another evidence of Satan's personhood by the fact that because of his wicked and treacherous evil deeds, he will be held morally responsible in the end by God. So says Matthew 25 and Revelation 20. So again, multiple evidences we can see that Satan is indeed a very real person from Scripture. Now, let's talk about his character. When we spoke on the Holy Spirit, and we were asking this question, is the Holy Spirit a real person? We looked at the Holy Spirit's character, and we saw that he had the divine attributes of the triune God, of course. So we're going to do the same here with, with Satan. We're going to look at the names that he's been given in Scripture, and that will give you a really strong clue as to his character, with a couple of exceptions. We'll start with the one that I use primarily, which is Satan. That's the primary term used in the Scriptures 54 times, which means, does anybody know what Satan means? adversary that's right or the devil 34 times which means slanderer there are a lot of other names that warn us about his intentions and his activities uh, revelation 9 11 gives us four names king he's called a king he's king over the demons he's called the angel of the bottomless pit uh, in hebrew he's called abaddon which is always associated with death and destruction, or in Greek, Apollyon. Both of these names from uh, Revelation 9-11, Abaddon and Apollyon, refer to Satan as the angelic king with, de with dominion over demons in the bottomless pit. And J.D. will talk more about that next week, his minions. Uh, he is also called the god of this world, 
and I think that's satirical, mocking, God in his providence ordained that Satan is the superior power of this earthly world, but he is not deity. So that word God of this world is not to be taken, taken that he's worthy of worship or a deity. It's, it's not because of uh, his character, just because of the position he's been given. That's from 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this world. Three different times in his gospel, the apostle John calls him the ruler of this world. And also Ephesians 2.2 2 refers to him as the prince of the power of the air, the air being anywhere in our atmosphere, beneath heaven, above the dirt. Also, according to scripture, as we saw in 1 Kings uh, 22, uh, 2 Chronicles 18, he's called spirit. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Spirit already came. Prince of demons in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And in Genesis 3, we all know that he was called the serpent. And three other books actually call him serpent. Isaiah, 2 Corinthians in the book of Revelation. The prophet Isaiah also called him Leviathan. And in the book of Revelation, he's called dragon numerous times. So when you see dragon in the, in the Revelation, uh, the account of Revelation, that is talking about Satan. He's also known, uh, like we said, Satan is another word for adversary. And he is called, um, oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself, the accuser. The accuser, that's in Zechariah in the book of Revelation. Tempter, many New Testament books call him the tempter. Ah, here, adversary, another name for Satan. Again, 1 Peter 5, 8, be, be watchful and sober-minded. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around seeking someone to devour. Matthew and Luke also called him enemy. He is the enemy of God, the enemy of the church. He's called the evil one in multiple New Testament. Testament passages. And in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he's also called the strong man. He is incredibly powerful. Matthew, Mark, and John also called him Beelzebul. 2 Corinthians 6 calls him Belial. In 1 Kings, 2 Chronicles, lying spirit. Jesus called him liar in John 8 44. Not only is Satan a perpetual liar, he is also the originator of lies. And Jesus, in the same passage, John 8, 44, called him the father of lies. And in that same verse, Jesus also called him a murderer, saying he was a murderer from the beginning. And then there's this one, Lucifer, which is a little controversial. If you, if you uh, do a research on Lucifer, a lot of scholars tell you that doesn't really refer to Satan, but it does. Trust me, it does. Uh, the only place we find Lucifer... Uh, is in the King James Version or the New King James Version of Isaiah 14.12. The original word here in the Hebrew was Hillel, which means uh, light bringer or shining one. You see the, the NIV, the NASB, the ESV, the Amplified Version. Instead of Lucifer in Isaiah 14.12, they'll say day star, morning star, um, light bringer, something like that. But it has to be that, well... Satan is called an angel of light. He kind of fools people. This has to be mocking and satirical because Jesus in the New Testament is called the angel of light, the light bringer. So when you see Lucifer, it means light bringer. Uh, the, the, uh, the biblical scholar Jerome was translating directly from the Hebrew to the Latin Vulgate, and he didn't want to go from the Greek Septuagint. So lux for light, ferre for bringer, light bringer, lux ferre, that's where you get that. But it doesn't depict who he really is. The, the vast majority of the names in scripture show us his character. He is a lying, murderous, evil, deceptive enemy that hates us and hates God. And for now, he's the ruler of this world, which explains a lot of things. All right, let's look at uh, his history, what he's done in the past. We'll talk a little bit about what he's doing in the present and then what he's going to do in the future, his schemes. Remember, uh, Satan sinned and deceived and murdered from the beginning. This is what we're reminded of in uh, 2 Corinthians 11.3 reminds us, the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning. This is why in 2 Corinthians 2.11, Paul pleads with the believers, and this is as valid for us today, 
as it was to the church then, he pleads with them not to be ignorant of Satan's schemes and his design so that we are not outwitted by him. So it's really critical as we talk through who is Satan, what are his intentions, we have to understand that he always has, always does, and always will use lies and deceit in an attempt to bring the world into his perverted way of thinking, away from the truth of God. That has always been his mode of operation to lead humanity throughout all of the way of, through history, beginning with Adam and Eve, away from God's truth. And if you recall, what he did with Eve was he, he did the tactic he still does today. He said, did God really say? Did God really say that? Right from the start, that's how he began, getting people to doubt God's word. But remember, this is really important as, as I talk through some of the things that Satan has done in the past, no matter how evil, no matter how treacherous, whatever he does today and what he does in the future, God, in his sovereignty, has always overruled and conquered everything that Satan has done, ever will do, to his glory. That's the important thing to keep in mind here as we learn about this evil, I call him a scumbag. Satan's most evil attacks have always served God's righteous purposes. So you think about back in the Garden of Eden, after, after Adam and Eve sinned, God immediately promised to send a redeemer that would come and have judgment on the evil one and bring redemption to mankind. That's always been the plan. Also, if you think about Genesis 50, when Joseph's brothers threw him in a pit and left him for dead. Remember that story? And then they had a, a fit of conscience and they came back and instead of leaving him for dead, they sold him into slavery into Egypt. What happened? He rose to power under Pharaoh, became a great and powerful leader, built up food stores enough that while his brothers in the, in the promised land were about to be extinguished, which I believe was Satan's plan. Do you know who was in those brothers? These were the sons of Jacob, the forefathers of the nation of Israel, which, by the way, included Judah, the tribe of Judah through whom Christ would come. Satan wanted them dead. But Joseph brought them to Egypt, thus preserving the line of the Messiah and the nation of Israel. So when Joseph said to his brothers, what you intended for evil, God meant for good, that's an example of Satan following right along with God's plan to preserve the Messiah and the line. Pretty incredible, isn't it? Think about the book of Job. Satan, God, gave authority to touch all that Job had, including his possessions and his family. But he couldn't touch Job. Even when Job lost all of his possessions and his family, he didn't curse God. Instead, he worshipped him. And then in chapter 2, God granted Satan the authority to go ahead and touch him physically. And it didn't take very long for, for Job to suffer miserably to the point where his wife said, just curse God and die. But again, Job did not curse God. Again, he worshipped him. And so even though Satan wanted to sift Job and prove to God, the only reason that Job really loved God, it was a self-serving loyalty, he said, just because you've been so good to him. God demonstrated through Satan's evil plan that no, when I grant a believer faith, I will preserve them. This is what uh, the shield of faith is, God's faithfulness to us. His love, we can never be separated from, even by the powers of Satan. So in that story of Job, we see Satan, once again, being used as God's lackey to demonstrate God's authority. The book of Matthew, this is so fascinating. God ordained and used Satan's tempting of Christ in the wilderness to serve his sovereign purposes. You think about this. In every physical way, Christ was tempted. He'd been in the wilderness for 40 days. Think how hungry that we are after fasting for a day. And Satan said, you'd have bread, man. Turn these rocks into bread. He tempted him with pride. All this could be yours. I'll give it to you if you worship me. And cast yourself down. God will surely save you. And Jesus could have pridefully demonstrated, yes, I am. But he spoke scripture and Satan left so Satan, think about the evil that was perpetuated that day. Satan tempting the very son of God. Is that not evil? And yet what happened? Jesus demonstrated that he was without sin, that he was unswervingly faithful to the word of God. I mean, he was the incarnate word of God. 
And that he had the authority and dominion over Satan not to let him defeat him, showing that he was the son of God, even in that act of evil. So Satan unwittingly uh, showed us that. By the way, it was really interesting every time Christ was tempted, he spoke scripture. He spoke the words of Moses, Deuteronomy, and that was enough to defeat Satan. Uh, move forward to John 13. Satan served God in a really unusual and unexpected way with the events leading up to the crucifixion of Christ. Remember, before the Passover meal, uh, Satan entered Judas, who was prompted to go to the local church authorities and launch a little conspiracy to lead Christ to his death, to be crucified. And then that night of the Passover meal, once again, Satan enters Judas. Did I say Jude? I meant Judas if I said that. Judas, Satan enters Judas, and Christ dispatches him. He goes, go do what you must do quickly. And then they came and got him, and he was led to the cross where he was crucified. But you know what's really interesting? If you remember those three words that Christ said right before he gave up his spirit, what did he say? It is finished. It is finished. He pronounced a judgment on Satan right there before he died. What that meant was that he had paid the fine. We broke the law. He fulfilled the law. Justice was done. There was sufficient punishment for the breaking of the law. And blood was spilled, Christ's blood was spilled as a payment for that massive fine. So he satisfied the justice that God requires for breaking the law. That's why he said it's finished. And when he did this, he destroyed the works of the devil who wanted Christ dead, who wants us dead. You see, Satan hates humanity. He really hates us. He wants all of us dead. That's why when God says, be fruitful and multiply, think about when um, Noah came off of the ark. What did he, God commanded him and his people, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth, he said. Satan wants the opposite. He hates life. He wants people dead. That's why he loves the abortion movement. He eugenics movement, the depopulation movement. He loves mechanical and biological warfare. He wants us dead. He wanted Christ dead. But through his death on the cross, Christ destroyed the one that has the power over death but can't touch your soul. He has no power over the second death. Only the Lord God does. So he defeated evil. He defeated death. And I want you to think about the cross that we have hanging behind me here in the sanctuary and why it's so important. It is a constant reminder, yes, of Christ's victory over death. Unlike the Catholic Church that leaves a dead Jesus on the cross, we remember that this cross is empty because he rose from death and defeated Satan's plans. At the same time, it is also, think about this, a, a constant eternal reminder of Satan's utter defeat. Let me explain what I mean by that. You see, Satan entered Judas and betrayed Christ because he wanted him dead. But he's a little schizophrenic and idiotic because a few days earlier he had a different plan. And it sh this should show to us that Satan really truly does not understand the word of God or prophecy. This is why Christ spoke in parables. He said, the world doesn't understand me. This is why I speak this way. Unless God opens your eyes to understand these things, you won't know. So, Satan, a few days earlier had wanted to keep Christ from the cross. If you remember a few days before Christ went to Jerusalem, what he told his disciples, he said, the Son of Man, the Son of God, must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. Now Satan must have gone, oh, no, 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 no. And so Peter, with Satan speaking through him, says, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And you remember what Christ said to Satan at that moment? He says, get behind me, Satan, for you are a hindrance to me because you have your mind set on the things of man and not on the things of God. See, Satan didn't want Christ to go there. He was trying to convince him not to do it. So this is a supreme example of Satan once again, whatever scheme he has to send him to the cross to kill him and snuff him out permanently or to keep him from going to the cross, the bottom line is God's plan was accomplished either way, wasn't it? And Satan was an unwitting servant in God's plan. This is why we see 1 Peter 1.18, verse 20, 
reminds us as believers that we were ransomed with the precious blood of Christ and he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. So again, this plan for Christ to go to the cross and die and be resurrected was not plan B when Satan entered the world in evil. This was foreknown before the foundation of the world and Satan could do nothing against it no matter how hard he tried. And he served God's purposes in leading Christ there, helping get him there, and being defeated. Isn't that funny? Now let's talk about Satan's present schemes for a couple of minutes because he's, he's the same evil, murderous scumbag he's always been. And we have to understand that. Again, his chief activity in the lives of Christians is to get them to think contrary to God's word and to get them to act disobediently to God's will. Paul, writing to the believers in Corinth, said, I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. That's 2 Corinthians eleven three. Satan, our adversary, daily attempts to outwit and outthink us through spiritual warfare, and he disguises himself as what? As an angel of light. This is what 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen 14 says. Even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. He appears to be a friend on the outside, but inside he is still a murderous, deceiving, evil, hateful person. 2 Corinthians 1, 15 says, It is no surprise then if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Again, J.D. is going to talk about um, those evil servants next week. I want you to also, though, as we talk about Satan's schemes in the present day and how he disguises himself as an angel of light, consider the book of Jude. If you haven't read it or done a Bible study on it, it's only 25 verses long, but it's a warning to the church of Satan's schemes. Now, we covered the book of Jude uh, last year when we finished up our survey through the New Testament. It was wonderful. A lot of churches ignore or don't look at the book of Jude, maybe it's prideful. Well, Satan could never penetrate the walls of our church. He would never infiltrate our church. But I want you to look for a moment what we studied in this book. Verse 4 is a very serious warning. For certain people have crept in unnoticed. Verse 12 calls them hidden reefs, wandering stars. We know the angels are called wandering stars. Think of the imagery here, slipping in unnoticed, hidden reefs. You know, when boats get ground on reefs that they didn't see, it's because they were hidden. And it made me think about, in the wild, the best predators are the ones that blend in. And they're not always looking for the strongest of the herd. They're looking for the weak, the immature, the ones on the outside of the flock. But again, that's why we have the words from 1 Peter 5, 8. I'll I'll say it, I think, about three times today. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Because your adversary, the devil, prowls around, present tense verb there, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And he is still prowling around today. And he lies and he hides lies within the truth. This is his prime strategy for deception. I mean, he's no dummy. He knows that people will more readily believe something that's almost true or sounds like it could be true. It's like when we feed our dog medicine that tastes horrible, we wrap it in a piece of lunch meat, and Sophie just swallows it right down. Satan does the same thing. A lot of, a lot of insidious lies that are, boy, I'll list just a couple of them I could think of. They're wrapped in Christian-sounding terminology with many mentions of the gospel, and this is what you should do to love your neighbor. So today, Satan is definitely not relenting. He is currently using a lot of schemes. One I'll just briefly mention is something called the new spirituality. If you've heard people say, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual, this is just the New Age movement, which was exposed in the 80s, but Satan's no dummy. He rebrands, he repackages, he relaunches. So again, a lot of Christian terminology, people talk about Christ and Christ consciousness and spirituality. It's a spiritual experience without any moral responsibility. And you would not believe, it's much more prevalent in the world today, and many Christians are taken in. Uh, then we also see the social justice movement. Satan uses the social justice movement. He twists the word justice 
which we all want justice, or to take things like critical race theory. We're all adamantly against racism, but he twists these things and uses them. And I will also throw in this new, uh, I would just call it a medical religion that says, if you don't get a certain medical intervention, you are not loving your neighbor. All of these things that the world is telling us to do in order that we would be holy, it's not the gospel, but it's always packaged by a lot of ministries and places with a lot of just right Christian terminology and mentions of the gospel and love your neighbor and people swallow it and are taken in. So again, this is why we need to be uh, sober-minded and watchful. By now, of course, after, I just have to comment here, after witnessing the numerous lies that we've seen in the last 18 months, the bold-faced, tyrannical, lockstep, heavy-handed evil arising by the way of nearly every government in the world against people, we need to continue to pray for discernment so that we don't easily fall for Satan's schemes. And fortunately, we have the book of James chapter 3 to be able to filter lies from truth. James chapter 3 helps you discern whether something is from above or from below. And like the book that we all read, many of us read last year, we live not by lies. It's a good, good filter. Okay, so we've talked about some of Satan's past schemes Hopefully I've dealt a little bit with what Satan is still doing. Same, same um, uh, strategies. Let's talk a little bit about his future schemes, and then let's talk about how it's going to turn out for him. In 2 Thessalonians 2.11, Paul writes that God will send a, stra- uh, a strong delusion to the world so that people will believe what's false. Later in that, in that uh, passage, he says he's going to have the restrainer step aside, and he's going to let Satan's undiluted and unrestrained evil have sway over all the earth. Satan will temporarily have even greater freedom to give people exactly what they want to believe, which is a lie. And that ultimate lie will deceive the world's population. It's a lie that the Antichrist, Revelation calls him the beast, is God, and that salvation can only come through him. And again, if you've been paying close attention to what's been going on in the world this last year and a half, you might be wondering if we are seeing the precursor to this great delusion. I don't know. Regardless, the point is that here, according to this verse, God will send a strong delusion, and he's going to remove the restrainer. We don't know if that's the Holy Spirit or the uh, Archangel Gabriel. And Satan will fulfill the preordained plan that God has laid out for us in Revelation. And the good news is this, this is God's plan, and Satan just goes right along with it. So after that delusion, here's what Satan's going to do. He's going to execute his scheme pretty shortly thereafter. There will come a point in the final seven years of human history, uh, the end of days. Uh, A lot of people refer to it as the tribulation, but Scripture actually calls it Daniel's 70th week from Daniel 9.27. Right in the middle of that Daniel 70th week, in other words, three and a half years in, we'll be introduced to two other people that are going to join Satan in what MacArthur and Mayhew call the Satanic Trinity. We also know it as the Unholy Trinity. Three and a half years into the Daniel 70th week, we'll be introduced to someone called the Beast. Paul calls him the man of lawlessness. Uh, John calls him the son of perdition. We commonly know him as the Antichrist. And then the second person the false prophet, or the second beast in Revelation. So at that three-and-a-half-year midpoint, if you look at Revelation 13, Satan gives the beast power and his throne and great authority to rise to power as the whole world follows him. And they worship Satan and the beast, and the beast is in authority for 42 months, it says, that last three-and-a-half years. And then the beast, a.k.a. Antichrist, makes war on the saints, after which the false prophet appears, performing miraculous wonders to cause people to worship the beast and his image or to be killed or slain. The false prophet also mandates that the world's population take the mark of the beast, 666, in order to complete financial transactions. In other words, to be able to buy and sell. And again, this beast system and its global mandates will continue for 42 months, three and a half years, until Christ's 
second coming, and he's going to end this evil beast system, kingdom, and Jesus Christ will reign for a thousand years, according to Revelation 20. In all of this, this is the important point, Satan functions as God's servant by fulfilling prophecy, setting up these world events that lead to the triumphant return of Christ and the inauguration of his millennial kingdom on earth. And this brings us to our next topic, Satan's future judgment. When Christ announced at the cross, it is finished, he was, he was proclaiming something that he was going to fulfill. And, and we're going to see this action. Well, I don't know if we will. I, I think all of the world will see this. His victory will be actualized and realized when hum, human history comes to a close and all the events take place. First, that beast system has to deceive the world. Then according to Revelation 19, Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, will come down from heaven on a white horse, followed by the armies of heaven, and then the battle of Armageddon takes place. And the beast is captured along with him, the false prophet, and they're both thrown into hell for all eternity. I can't help but smile when I read that part. And their enemies are quickly obliterated. It doesn't take very long. That's Revelation 19. Now, immediately following that battle, an angel will descend from heaven, He's going to seize Satan, wrap him in chains, and throw him in the bottomless pit. And he's going to be bound for a thousand years. This is the first three verses of Revelation 20. And from this point forward, he will no, no longer be able to be in heaven accusing us to God. He will no longer be the accuser. For a thousand years, this earth will be free from Satan roaming around. Christ will be the sole ruler of this world, and he'll rule without any interference from Satan. So I, I'm sorry if you think the Republican or the Democratic Party ha, has got the best administration. This is the one we should all vote for, and it's the one I would like to live under. Amen? amen. Lots of amens there. And then comes Satan's final eternal judgment, which is detailed in Revelation 20, verse 7 through 10. I'll read it here. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison... And will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil, who had deceived them, was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So in the end, Satan is led out of the bottomless pit. He leads a rebellion. Then he gets thrown into the lake of fire where the, the beast and the false prophet had already been for a thousand years. Isn't it fun getting to read the ending of the story? Well, we know who wins. And then, of course, the good part, which we're not teaching on today, the new heaven and earth comes. Save that for another day. So let's finish up by talking about what is a believer's defense against Satan? How are we to think about these things? How are we to deal with these as believers? I hope by now I've proven to you that we've looked at enough scripture that you understand that Satan is a very real, very evil, very present danger. And he's very, very powerful. In fact, he possesses the highest power of the created beings. However, it's important to remember that his power does not include omniscience, omnipotence, Omnipresence, he's not immutable, he's not sovereign, he's not eternal, he's not immortal. Those are divine attributes that only belong to the creator God. 2 Timothy 1.7 reminds us that God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and of love and self-control. I have to remind myself of this. We have to remind ourselves of this. This is why we go back to Scripture. God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and of love and self-control. And then I want to quote my dad's favorite verse. Galen Huffman loved 1 John 4.4. 4. He who is in you, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. That means... 
The power of God, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, the triune God is in the believer, and he is greater than he who is in the world, referring to Satan. This is why Paul asked the question in Romans 8.31, if God is for us, who can be against us? And the answer in the following eight verses, man, go to Romans 8 and read it. I've had to. They unequivocally guarantee that there's no one that can be against us in the eternal sense, that no one and no thing, including Satan, can separate us from the love of God. And when God grants us the gift of faith, that's why in Ephesians, when he talks about putting on the whole armor of God, faith is the shield that guards us from Satan. God will preserve the faith of the saints like he did for Job. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. According to James 4, 1 John 2, believers can overcome his power. Let's look at Ephesians 6, 11 as we close here. It says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. So how do we do this? How do we practically do this? Let's look forward to verses six, uh, 17 and 18 of Ephesians 6. With the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, Satan hates the word of God more than anything. Remember when we talked about Matthew chapter 4, the adversary, Satan tempting Christ. Christ pulled out the sharpest two-edged sword in the universe, spoke the words of Moses to him, Deuteronomy, three times. <whistles> Satan disappeared. And we must pray, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. John Bunyan once said, you, you can do more than pray after you've prayed, but you can't do more than pray until you've prayed. We have to pray. We have to be in the Word. These are the tools that God has given us. And we remember the Lord's Prayer, which Christ taught his disciples. We always close that prayer with, but deliver us from evil. And um, I need to remember to pray that prayer more. And then, of course, when we finish this prayer, we always say, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. The kingdom does not belong to Satan. The power and the glory do not belong to him. The whole reason Satan exists is so that he will be defeated. He will be a servant to God's plans, and God will be glorified. Isn't that glorious? So that's where we're going to end, because these things belong to our Heavenly Father, God the Creator. And that's where I'm going to close this morning, and I'll invite you to come back here in 15 minutes, and we'll worship this Creator God.